we are here to raise up a militant church. We are here to raise up a triumphant church. We are here to raise up a prevailing church. That is all I am for. I'm not for entertainment. If you came for entertainment, you can pack your load and go. If you came for the word of God, a change in your life, a transformation in your life, and you say, I want to be part of a church that is standing on this truth that can never change the people, the kind of people we're inviting. We don't want to invite people that should not come and spoil our church. They want to entertainment. They want to only food and only this and only that. The church that will continue and the church that will stand built on the rock of ages that will never move by any flood, by any persecution, by any vehement heat uh, blowing on us. Those are the kind of people we want and I pray that you'll be one of them. And I say you'll be one of them in Jesus' name. The church that is ready to pray. The church that is ready to bring that purity and holiness and sanctification. Bring it back to the church. The church that is standing on the totality of the word of God. Not only on faith, on healing, on deliverance, on prosperity, on this, on that. On the totality of the word of God. That is the real church and that is the true church. And that is the church we are going to stand for till the end of our lives in Jesus' name. That's why it says in verse 46, and they continuing daily. They continued not only during the, the you know, Christmas time. They continued not only during the, the covenant month. They continued not only during the time they are in Lagos. Yeah, they continue steadfastly, it says, with one accord in the temple. And in breaking of bread and from house to house. And did eat their meat with, with gladness and singleness of our praising God. And then it says, and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added unto the, unto what? Unto what? unto the church daily. Who are the kind of people added to the church? Such as should be saved. Those are the kinds of people the Lord is adding to the church and I pray you'll be such a person in Jesus' name. I'm looking at this from three perspectives. Number one, conversion. Number two is consecration. Number three is continuation. Number one is conversion. Number two is consecration. And number three is continuation. Number one, conversion and acknowledge salvation. Conversion and acknowledge salvation. Salvation that is known to heaven. Salvation that is known to the Lord. Salvation that is known to your neighbors. Salvation that is known in your own heart. The spirit bearing witness that you are born again. You are a child of God. Conversion and acknowledge salvation. Then there is consecration and absolute surrender. The people who know him as Christ. They know him as Lord. They know him as King. They know him as Master. They know him as the owner of their lives. And they have this consecration and absolute surrender. And then you have continuation and abiding sanctification, abiding satisfaction. Continuation and abiding, abiding satisfaction. This is the true church. The church of where you have conversion. True church, you have salvation. The true church, you have consecration. The true church, you have absolute surrender. And the true church, you have consecration uh, and uh, continuation. The true church, you have abiding satisfaction. Number one again is conversion and acknowledge sal sal salvation in a transformed church. In a transformed church, a church that has passed through the washing, the cleansing of the blood, a church that has passed through all that reformation, all that transformation, all that change, the newness that we have in Christ, conversion and acknowledge salvation in a transformed church. Number two is consecration and absolute surrender in a true church. If there is no consecration, if there is no absolute surrender, there's no true church. That's just like a club. That's just like a society. That's just like an assembly. But a real church, a true church, there will be consecration and there will be absolute surrender. Number three, continuation and abiding satisfaction. Uh, that you're satisfied with Christ. All that Christ offers, that's what you're satisfied with in a teaching church. In a teaching church, a church that will teach the word of God, a church that will not minimize anything. Those people are there, don't talk about this. Those people are there, don't talk about that. Those people are there, they can't talk about that. We have what, thousands of people. Among those thousands of people, there are some weak people, don't talk about their weakness. There are some people who are sinful, don't talk about their sin. They are covetous, we don't talk about their covetousness. Because if you talk about that, that will, that will make them have ill feeling. It will kind of rob them in the wrong direction. 
what are we going to talk about then when we don't talk about all the things that God needs to change in our lives but the people that understand that this is the true church and it is a teaching church and we come to the word of God and we teach everything without looking at the face of anyone and that is the kind of church this church is going to be in Jesus name give me a good amen right over there number one what's number one again Conversion and glorious salvation in a transformed church. You can see this, what the Lord has told us over there. It says, save yourself from this outward generation. And the people that gladly, cheerfully, joyfully receive that word, those were the people that were counted as part of the church. Why? Because uh, that's what is required. You saw what uh, the apostle told them when he said, what shall we do then, men and brethren? What shall we do? And he told them exactly what to do. He didn't say, just join our church. They didn't just say, just put your name down. They didn't say, we need your telephone number there. They didn't say, well, you just tell them, just tell us that you are committed to us now. Any project we are going to have, you are going to be part of it. No, they said, repent. And it is that word of repentance the Lord is still bringing to us today. If anyone is going to be a part of the church of the living God, there must be that repentance. You look at your life, and we're not pleading with you. We're not begging you. You know, when you beg people to repent, they have a, maybe a catalog of sins. They have about 70 or 72 or 73 sins, and you plead and plead, and they surrender, and okay, I drop uh, you know, my cigarette. And then, you, while you're talking and talking and pleading with them, motivating them, and saying, you know what, uh, well, when we, when, if we repent, we get this salvation, we have joy, we have peace, we have rest of mind. If we have, you know, the trouble in families, you remove all the trouble and then at that sick about it. And then we go to heaven, we're going to walk on the streets of, uh, okay, as you say that, okay, I drop another five and then you still have I mean, six or something six remaining. The people on their own that say, I know a drop of sin, a little sin, only one sin will take me to hell. I don't want to go to hell. And they turn away from their sins and repent and then they say, oh Lord, I need your mercy, I need your salvation, I need your cleansing. Those are the people that get converted and those are the people that actually are called part of the church. Look at this in chapter 3 of Acts. Acts chapter 3, I'm reading verse 19, repent ye therefore and be converted. It's the conversion that follows after repentance, turning away from sin, every form of sin in your life. And then you say, you come clear, you come clean and everything that is evil, whether public or private, whether external or internal, whether visible or invisible, whether it is known to men or it is not known to men, you say, I repent, I turn away from them. It is that sincere repentance, that sincerity in turning away from sin that actually brings this conversion and this new life into you. It says, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Look at verse 26. Unto you first God have been raised up his son Jesus sent him to bless you in turning away everyone in turning away everyone in turning away every one of you from his watch iniquities all the iniquities it's when the Lord has done that you have a church when he turns you away from all your iniquity and, and there's a sincere following after the Lord there's a sincere conversion a sincere change of life and transformation that if any man be in Christ the new creature all things are passed away and all things have become new because that is the ministry that is the mission of what Jesus Christ came to do Matthew chapter 1 I'm reading from verse 21 Matthew chapter 1 verse 21 it says in verse 21 and she shall come she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall do what? Tell me out loud. Tell me out loud. He shall save his people from their sins. He doesn't save them into their sins. He doesn't leave them in the defilement, in the degradation, in their iniquity, in their evil. He'll save his people from their sins. I know we're talking about dawn. We're talking about evangelization. We're talking about people coming to the Lord. How many of those people will say we're winning today? How many of them are getting the same kind of salvation that we got? The same kind of salvation that we experienced, that when we came to the Lord Jesus Christ, 
Christ without any preacher running after us, without any preacher trying to say, hi about this, hi about that, hi about that. Sincerely, wholeheartedly, from all our sins, we gave everything to the Lord because we knew that Jesus Christ came for this one single purpose. He shall save his people from their sins. And when we yielded to the Lord like that, we were saved, our lives were transformed, and everything became totally different. In Titus chapter 2, I'm reading there from verse 11. When salvation comes, this is what that salvation does. If you are truly saved, this is what it has done. If it has not done this, you are not saved. You are not born again. You are just doing church. In Titus chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 11. It says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto how many people? All men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly loss. When that salvation comes, you deny ungodliness. That means to say no to ungodliness. Well, I'm not going to follow you to your office. I'm not going to follow you to your family. I'm not going to follow you to your village. I'm not going to follow you when they, when they say, come and become a cheap, a half cheap title. I won't follow you to the places you go. In the places where you have to give bribe, I don't follow you there. It is you. If there's still salvation there, that will say no. No to sin and no to evil. A preacher, the preacher that preached before me now here, in our location here, he will say that somebody was coming for the Congress and they saw a lady and they messed up his life and all that. We don't follow them where they go. It is the salvation in you. If you are really saved, that you know will make you say no. You deny ungodliness and worldly laws. If you are not able to do that, it is because you are not born again. It is because you are just a church member. Forget title and forget I am this and that. Who made you that? Jesus didn't make you that. They interviewed you and somebody said, looks like you can be like this, can be like this. That one is the work of man for the salvation. The conversion that no man can do. That's the Lord that gave that to you. So if you discover that even though you are at this level, you are called overseer, you are called pastor, you are called minister, we made you that. And we can make mistakes. Samuel made mistake. When it was to choose a king, we can make a mistake in choosing a king, in choosing a pastor, in choosing an overseer. The people can make mistake. And he can say that one is overseer and that one is pastor. And therefore, when you find out that a so-called pastor, a so-called minister is messing up with girls or ladies in the church, we just made mistake in putting him there. He doesn't have the mark of a real Christian. And Christ has not made him a citizen in the kingdom of God. And sometimes you find that they say that one is a worker, that one is this. And then we hear some terrible stories, like the story our brother was telling. And then you say, I'm surprised. Why are you surprised? That's the worst. And it can in the camp. There was a Judas in the team. And because of that, some people say, I don't know about that salvation. I know about my own salvation. Do you know about your salvation? I said, Do you know about your salvation? The salvation that saves us from sin and takes away all that defilement away from our lives that the call of the Lord has called you to salvation. And he talks about denying ungodliness and worldly lust. And then he goes on to say in that verse 12, and it says, and we should live. How do we live? How do we live? That's salvation. You know the frivolity of some people who are not born again. And when they're in, their, they're in our midst, you will see them in the hostel. No problem. They just came in here and somebody put down their names and then they registered them. We can make a mistake in registering you to come here. And then you find the frivolity there. You find all the jesting there. You find all those uh, slander there. You find all those things there. And all the actions that, you know, as I, I stop wondering, you are used to what I said. How can, how can he be that way? How can she be that way? How can be, how can be, be like? Now I realize, now I realize that it's not the choice of God that brought you to the Congress. It's the choice of man that somebody wrote your name and registered you and then you paid the right amount and then you came in over here and then they say these are congress participants but not strangers to the practice of the world and not pilgrims going to heaven it is the kind of choice that god makes that makes us sober and righteous and holy and sanctified and when we see that we say that is a real child of god and i pray that that mark will see your life in jesus name 
How can we follow all of you to all your hostels and all the places you have come from? How do we follow you to the frivolous things you see over there and the lies you tell over there and all that and this and that? And then when your pastor is uh, passing, your overseer is passing, then you say, well, keep quiet now. That's my overseer coming. Now, who are you deceiving? You're just deceiving yourself. And I pray that you're not going to the same place that Judas went to in Jesus' name. But it tells us here that when we're really born again, real children of God, you're waiting for the coming of the Lord. It says in verse 13 here, it says, it says in verse 13, it says, um, that's Titus chapter 2, verse 13. It's telling us about the attitude of a real child of God. Now looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that she might redeem us from how many iniquities? All iniquity. You don't tell me that you're a Christian, you're a real child of God. You know, I'm born again. If, if you knew my life, I used to smoke this and smoke that. I used to smoke, uh, you know, the weed and the marijuana. I don't smoke that anymore. I just smoke the, you know, ordinary ones anymore. Now, you're not born again. You're not a child of God. You deceive me. I used to have, uh, you know, how many girlfriends I would have and mess up with that, mess up with that. But now, you know, I've reduced the number now. It's only this uh, last one. Uh, my wife doesn't know about her, but she is only this the last one, I'm still, you know, because it's very difficult to resist her. All the other ones have, you know, turned their photographs, have, you know, turned their letters, but just this one, that single one will take you to hellfire. And then when you get there forever and ever, you tell the story to all the people there that you tried, but you know, only this one remaining took you to hell. I pray God will save you in Jesus' name. If you're looking for the Lord and say, I want to serve the Lord, all those iniquities, everything is gone. Because it says he gave himself that he might redeem us from all iniquity and to purify unto himself. What kind of people? Religion. That's what, what kind of people? A peculiar people. Are you peculiar? Your office, are you peculiar? When you look at your character, are you peculiar? When you, they look at your dressing, those ladies that they, you know, say we're members of Deeper Life, where, you know, I've been a member of Deeper Life, I, and I look at them and I say, I can't see any difference between your dressing, your appearance, and the people who are in the world there. If you didn't say you are Deeper Life, I'll just count you that you're one of those other people that are out there. Because all the things that should be hidden, we see that, you know, your chest area, your, you know, all the other areas of your life, the anatomy of your body, we can see that very clearly. And I'm deeper life as which kind of deeper life? Not the one I'm generous to pretend it over, but the one that God used me. It is 73, that I saw the corruption in this land. I saw the defilement in this land. And God began to tell me, what are you going to do with your life? You want to become a professor and you want to, you know, stay in mathematics all your life, or you want to do something that will bring a change, a transformation in the lives of people and in the life of the nation. And then I remember the tennis lawn and uni life where I went to pray, where I made my commitment, when the call of God came to me. And I saw this great revelation of a multitude. I never saw a crowd like that in my life. And I saw a sea of heads like this. And then I, the Lord, and I even saw the kind of dressing I was wearing. They call it double two at that time in that revelation. And I saw that and I stood before the people. And then the Lord said, that's the people. I want you to bring the message of transformation and life unto them. And it was there at that tennis lawn that night that I told the Lord, I'm going to abandon all this and all this and all this. And the things not that came to me, all that I just kicked off and I said, this is what I'm going to do. You must understand, it was around that same year, not the following year, because this was 1973, that the following year, the university sent me to London and they made arrangement and then they said, when this man gets there, Professor so-and-so, talk to him that he'll stay over there for three years. We don't want him to come back until he has a doctorate degree to do this because we saw something in him. When I got to London, then they began to tell me, the prof called me and said, did your professor in Unilag tell you that you are to stay here for three? I said, no, I came for three months. And what I'm going to do here, I'm going to finish in two months because I have a retreat waiting for me in December. I went in October. He said, what? And then they said, they'll pay your salary in Nigeria. They'll give you salary in London. They'll give you this. And give. I said, no, that's not for me. And then the fellow was, he said, why? I said, I have a 